Welcome to Style DNA, the podcast I created to uncover the lives behind the looks of your favorite well known faces and help unveil their style DNA. As a designer, I've always been inspired by the premise that wearing the right pieces should make you feel the best version of yourself, gorgeous and confident, and that these pieces should be designed and crafted for longevity. I'm delighted to share that this episode is supported by Karen Millen, a brand that has a 42-year legacy in the world of fashion. Their commitment to affordable luxury and making investment pieces accessible has truly stood the test of time. Whether you're searching for a timeless winter coat that will serve you for years to come, or an elegant evening dress, you'll find both classic and modern designs that are perfect for refreshing your wardrobe for the season ahead. Online at karenmillan.com. Head over to my Instagram for a link to a special treat for listeners. Today, I'm going on a style journey with singer, songwriter and musician Corinne bailey Ray. Corinne shot to stardom with her self-titled Corinne bailey Ray debut album in 2006, featuring the global hits Put Your Records On and Like A Star. Since then, she's won multiple awards, including Grammys and Mobos, alongside nominations for Brit and Bet Awards. Her second album, The Sea, in 2010, was nominated for the prestigious Mercury Music Prize, while her third studio album, The Heart Speaks in Whispers, was released in 2016 to worldwide acclaim. In 2023, she released her fourth studio album, Black Rainbows, a truly remarkable piece of work, which is the result of a several years long conversation between Corinne and the objects and happenings in the Stony Island Arts Bank, Chicago. The album has received critical acclaim globally. Reviewers have been hailing it as Bailey Ray's career best work and have embraced the eclectic genre bending album as an indisputably one of the finest albums of 2023. Corinne is currently touring the UK before heading on to tour in Europe and the rest of the world. Hello and welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful to have you here because you're performing in London as of tomorrow night. Yes, that's right. We have three three shows in London and then we're going on to Europe. And then at the end of the European tour, we now have China and the Philippines. Amazing. Which I'm really looking forward to as well. Fantastic. Congratulations on the new album. It is extraordinary. I mean, I'm a long time fan. Um, I have to, you know, put my hand up Thank there. You. But um, I've really loved listening to it, especially whilst preparing for this interview. And as a creative, I'm always fascinated by where other creatives get their inspiration from and and reading into um what where your inspiration came from for this album i'd i'd love to hear it in your words i felt with this album that so much of the inspiration came through looking you know sometimes when you make a record people say who have you been listening to to what's your inspiration but in this case I was looking online at uh, a friend's Pinterest board, actually, in 2017, and I saw this photograph of Theasta Gates. I didn't know it was him, but it was Theasta Gates, the visual artist who had the Serpentine Pavilion last year in, in London. And he was standing in front of all this weird art, this contemporary art, and it was White Cube. But he had this expression on his face, which was so relaxed and confident and I thought who is this man and specifically who is this black man who's standing in front of what I thought was very strange contemporary art you know it's not figurative art it's not paintings of people it's a pile of bricks and a sculpture of a goat and the Harold's chicken shop sign I thought who is he and I researched him and found out that he's based in Chicago and part of his practice is finding buildings that are about to be taken down torn down destroyed by the city because they can't be maintained and he buys these buildings um, and he and he saves them for art and for the community so he had he had saved this arts bank he'd saved this bank um, from being demolished it was for, it's a bank from 1923 in Chicago on the south side which is a really um, underserved community you know I guess nobody says run down or poor these days but it's a challenged area it has these housing problems mental health problems dr- drug addiction violence you know all those things that go together to make an area really struggle 
And in the heart of it is this amazing bank, which w- would have been torn down by the city. He saved it. He bought it for a dollar. He raised four million dollars by selling his own artwork. And now instead of being full of money, it's full of all these incredible artworks. When I walked in, I saw um, a sound suit by Nick Cave on the wall. I saw Theaster's own work. I saw pieces from local Chicago artists, but it also contains archive. So it has all the books that were ever given to the Johnson Publishing Company who did Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine. So kind of life magazine for black people. Um, And the books have been collected since 1942 and they're on the widest range of subjects. You can imagine 26,000 books in this library. Everything from Ethiopian rock churches, mask, dance, uh, autobiographies, recipe books, stories of the black pioneers going west in America in the 1850s, really specific things as well. And then it has all of Frankie Knuckles' records. So when he passed away, they were given to the Arts Bank as well. So just reams and reams of house music, you know, vinyl. It also has all the glass slides from Chicago University. So when they digitized their archive, I guess they gave them to the bank. And so you're looking at, you know, the most famous works at the Louvre or Picasso paintings or, you know, um, Egyptian temples and structures and so that that's incredible and then on the highest floor up it has these difficult objects from america's past these um problematic you know race racist objects um that were collected by this black and chinese banker called ed williams who would go to flea markets and yard sales and find this stuff you know mammy jars um postcards, newspaper articles, photographs, you know, cartoonish images of black people. And he would collect them just to take them out of circulation. So he would have boxes and boxes of these things in his house. And he ended up giving his collection, which is 16,000 objects to the Arts Bank. So they can, I guess, work out how to show them and how to store them. So it's a really fascinating place. So when I toured in Chicago, I ended up meeting up with the Astor and he showed me around this bank and it's stunning. You know, it's this um, Greco-Roman, you know, it's columns beautiful, isn't it? building. Yeah, it's beautiful in itself. And then, you know, it's a contrast with what's happening outside because it's this underserved community. And there's this, you know, the double height library with those iron, you know, yeah. stairs that you can go up to the, the top floors. And it was just beautiful to be around in such a kind of beautiful, elegant, elevated space, but also around all this black archive. I think... I've been to grand libraries where I might read, you know, an original copy of Virginia Woolf or sit and read Marlowe or Shakespeare. But to be reading in the Black Archive in a place like that, that was my first experience of it. And to be around that volume of literature, I just really couldn't believe. I guess I wasn't aware that there were that many books on these black subjects Perhaps growing up, I might have had these questions about specific things and been told, oh, that wasn't written down. Oh, there's only oral tradition here. Maybe it's been lost to the sands of time or there's only hearsay. And to be around all these books and find these photos and evidence and documents. And it was really fascinating as someone who's interested in history, just to be able to sit and read. And did that just ignite all your synapses. Absolutely. I found when I left that I was just thinking about the bank. I was thinking about photos. I was pulling open drawers and finding these little precious black dolls wrapped in tissue paper. Who made them? When were they made? Who had them? What's their story? How old are they? Or finding a photograph of a little 12-year-old girl, you know, going west, a black girl going west with a white family, thinking, what's her story? What happened to her? Is there any documents? Is there any evidence? Or... Or then just seeing the sort of glamorous and fabulous things in Ebony magazine, Mm. you know, that I wasn't aware of. I'd seen so many images of maybe the civil rights movement, you know, so there's a lot of weight, seriousness, you know, heavy politics. But to be around the kind of 1950s glamour, black glamour, the black middle class in America, Mm. which was huge and you know, that I wasn't aware of and to have it so well documented in Life magazine and and find out, you know, who's putting on exhibitions and the swing coats and the hairstyles. It was just really a new bit of history for me 
that, that I was encountering. And so when I left, I was writing poems. I started writing songs. I went back and had a residency there. And then over the last seven years, really, it has been my obsession. It, it's always felt like all roads lead back to this place where I would see an exhibition. It would remind me of something I've seen or I'd discover an artist like Betty Saar for the first time and then find out there's a retrospective at the Prada Museum in Milan and go on a sort of pilgrimage to there. So that building sent me all around the world. But do you think that's going to open another door for another album, this whole um, sort of seeking out this black history, this black culture? I think it's opened up a thing in me of realising that it's OK and good to allow the things that interest you into whatever your chosen field is and not to feel boxed in. And I think certainly coming out of labels and out of more uh, pop music, you know, I felt with my last record, my third album, that was really... Uh, policing myself or gatekeeping myself in terms of what I thought was useful and acceptable. You know, I'd had an experience of playing songs to people, maybe in, in my wider team, and they might have said, hmm, you know, it's it's good, it's beautiful, but it's not the first single. There'll be a lot of that kind of talk. It's not the first, it's not radio. I don't know if people get it. So by the time I'd had that happen so many times to myself, I would be doing it to my myself you know in the studio or my bedroom I'd think what's the point of finishing this song it's too long it's too slow it's too weird it's about too much of a niche subject matter like it's not somehow universal I think the way that streaming affected music making so many people felt right the only way now to to kind of make it in music is to have, to have a radio smash you know I started calling them international mega smashes and I was getting to know Mark Ronson at the time and it seemed like every time I turned around Mark Ronson was having an international mega smash you know where it's just like you would hear it pouring out of every taxi and on every radio and you know and every nightclub and it would just be winning all these awards and so I think at the label lots of people were kind of feeling that way that you know you've had the success and you've had this critical claim, and now it's really time to kind of get back to the centre of the target, which is the international mega, mega smash. And then you have this kind of fruitless searching for the thing. You know, with my third record, that probably could have been three records, you know, with the amount of stuff that I wrote for it that either I rejected or someone else rejected, you know. And when I hear the album, I'm so pleased that I managed to kind of get it done because there was so much of a feeling of me not doing it right. And so with this record, I feel like everything seems to be open. You know, why not do something strange? Why not do something with all these different genres? I couldn't help it as I responded to all these different objects. You know, one had to be a punk song. One had to be a kind of operatic song. One had to be psychedelic soul. And so I just feel like I have given myself these different freedoms with the music. It's really interesting to me because there's sort of almost, there is a real parallel between music and fashion. And, you know, you, with fashion, you've got, you know, what is your brand identity? Does it fit into your brand codes and your brand guidelines and all of that? And I, and the musicians that I know talk about that, but it feels like you have absolutely bust those shackles with this album and said, actually, no, let's just try this. Let's try that. And it it's fantastically creative and evocative oh, as a result. You. I mean, I guess you know for yourself when you're making, you have to be excited about what you make. You don't want to just repeat the same things. And like you say about brand, I think artists don't like to think of themselves as a brand. And I think so many dis uh, so many designers, I mean, I guess it happens in a small cycle with a designer, but so many designers will then say, I have to leave this house in order to make something different or I have to go out on my own and do what really is in my heart. Or they have to say, I'm leaving fashion completely, you know, but I, I felt, and I guess I did a similar thing because when I was making this record, I said, this is a side project. It's not my own album. It's not going to come out under my name. So I don't have any of those ties. You know, I don't have any of That's those, like you might say, listeners or, you know, in fashion, the consumers, you know, I don't have to think with the person who normally wears my current Bailey Ray suit wear this you know I could yeah. really think this is what I want to do I don't have to think about any of that and and so it was only really towards the end of the process definitely after I'd finished all the recording that I decided I would 
have it be my own record and I would claim it as my own thing. And I'm really glad that I did. And you've been really brave to do that. And you've got the critical acclaim as a result of that. Thank so, you. Chapeau. No, I'm really pleased. Today, though, we're going on a style journey. Yes. Which so I love to do. How did you decide what you were going to wear here today? Well, that's a really good question. It, I mean, it's kind of slightly limited because I was coming on tour. I left my house in Leeds this morning and I have three suitcases that I take. So one suitcase is kind of kimonos, pajamas. I'm on the tour bus, but I'm still with people I work with, so I can't be too super casual. That's one suitcase. My other suitcase is all these jumpsuits I had made by this British designer called Mary Benson, who normally does all these really bohemian dresses. And I wanted her to make jumpsuits. I saw this design that she'd made. And it's all psychedelic. It's butterflies, but where the eyes would be, it's these strange eyes. And she gets it all to interlock. And I saw her in some dungarees on the street and said, that's amazing. And she said, they're mine. I made them. And I just said, can I come to your is it atelier? I, I came yeah. to the place where she makes the things and we designed these jumpsuits together. So I'm wearing her. So that's a suitcase. And I also got this amazing sequin sort of beaded kimono that I wear on top of those from Marco Hall, who's this brilliant, um, he, what does he call this style? It's like disco bohemian or something like that oh, you know fantastic. he's from he's from new were we in new jersey when we saw him and everything's just sort of fabulous and so i got a piece from him something else that's kind of like silver metallic and so i have that suitcase and then there's the kind of going to my interviews i had lots of things in there and as i left the house i realized those cases aren't going to be arriving in time to go and see you so i quickly <laughs> grabbed this jumpsuit, which my husband actually bought for me and I thought he did really love well, it. but I love the colour of it and I love the way that it makes me feel where I have been crumpled up on a on a train coming down from Leeds, looking after my two kids and making sure they eat something. It does make me feel then a different way that I'm, okay, now I'm going to do something where I'm going to be talking and I can be in this vibrant colour. And then this scarf, I, I just picked up in Nashville in a, a vintage shop. They had all I these amazing, all these amazing silk scarves for you know thirty dollars and twenty dollars, and yeah. and all these cool. I got my new favorite vest, which is from the eighties, and it's one of those. I ran the marathon in <laughs> such and such American city, so I feel a bit fraudulent because I've never ran a marathon. But I lived in that on my last tour. I, I'd say you've lived a marathon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's how I decided. Um, were you, would you say you were very aware of your mother's style growing up? I was really aware of my mum's style. My mum is very stylish. I was thinking of this on the train today, mm. that she's always been very stylish and chic. You know, she, when we grew up, she was actually cleaning houses. You know, it was before she worked. She cleaned houses. Then she cleaned at our school, our primary school. And the teacher called her into the office one day, the head teacher. And she thought, she thought she was going to say, can you come and do a bit more cleaning? And she thought, I really have to swallow my pride here. This is my children's primary school. But the head teacher said, would you like to come and read to the kids? Oh. And she did. And they loved her. And then she started working reading to children. Then she started working with children with special needs. And she ended up being at the school for, I, w I wonder how long, 20 odd years. She was at this very same primary school, but she worked with children with special needs for more than a decade. And then she worked in... Um, helping children with diversity, you know, bringing diversity into the curriculum. The school won an award. She's really brilliant. The school became an outstanding school. But, yeah, she was always very chic, even though she had no money. She used to work. She, I guess she worked in fashion in the sense that she worked in a shoe shop and a milliner, a well-known shoe shop in Leeds. I think it was called something like Vernon Humpage. <laughs> so she would do the window displays, and then she would, of course, spend all her wages on on um clothes like any good working class girl you know good not on gonna her. save up for anything it's going straight to shoes so she always had the good shoes from vernon humpage but my mum knew hats i remember going to a wedding with her where she had no money and she made a hat out of you know cornflake packet she cut the she cut the cardboard and she somehow sort of steamed it i guess she pinned it and then she had fabric that she laid it over oh. she had a little bit of gauze left over so it had this kind of stiff veil and it somehow matched a dress I don't know where the fabric came from whether she took up the dress but I remember thinking you know she's so elegant she would ride to school from a cleaning job on a on a bike in heels so I was always really aware that my mum was really well put together and I think because we were 
a working class family. You know, when we went to town, we went into Leeds, we always had to dress up. So we always had to wear our good shoes, which were our school shoes. And we always had to have cream on our legs and our long socks and our Sunday best on. And I always think when you are coming from a particular background, you really wanted to project a certain thing in the world. So we, in our case, we were trying to hide our um, poverty, you know? So we would look in the shops and we'd try things on that, you know, we we weren't going to be buying that week, but maybe we'd buy it next week because it was our birthday or next month because it was Christmas. But I always remember clothes as being a kind of way of moving from one group to another that I would always be aware that they would change the way people saw you and the way that you were seeing yourself. So I knew the power of, of clothes and when I could start to afford to buy clothes. And even when I was at university, you know, I did spend a good amount of money on clothes and because I was just interested in the, the sort of the way that you can project something about yourself. It, it's very interesting that, I mean, you have two sisters. Yes, that's right. And did you, did you influence each other? Did you dress each other? Did you borrow each other's clothes? Yes, we really did. I mean, I guess in the early days, a lot of our formal wear was matching, you know, so my mum's, my dad's mum would buy us a Christmas dress every year. So very often that would be, it might be the same dress in different colours. So my youngest sister, you know, she would always have three versions, you know, she'd wear hers until it ran out and then she wore Candace's until it didn't fit her, then she wore mine. But yeah, we we had different styles, I guess they had, we all had different body types and I was this really skinny one. I mean, all my sisters, my sisters are slim, but I was really underweight when I was little. So that also affected the way that I dressed, you know, I didn't want to look too thin. Yeah. So at school, I was always, always wear like two or three pairs of tights, you know, oh. I'd wear like 90 denier tights oh. on top of 90 denier tights because I really, I it didn't want my legs, legs to look too twiggy oh. because they were really skinny. And I like to wear, you know, I like to have some layers on or the opposite. I'd find it really hard to find stuff that fitted on my body. So I'd often be wearing, um, younger age, age group clothes but that's why I really got into vintage because suddenly you could find cuts maybe cuts from the 70s that were a bit more slim on the mm. body I remember when I was a teenager finding a, this amazing denim jacket which I thought was a three-quarter length sleeve and I looked at it and it was like for a nine-year-old or something <laughs> but it fit me really well it fit on the shoulders it was tight on the arms but it looked good and tight in the body and just that 90s um retro thing to look 70s that was really popular I guess when I was a teenager so you could find you know skin tight flares and lots of denim and old band t-shirts and that and it was cheap you know so that's I really got into fashion in that way and then I started you know going out and would meet all these mods and they'd have all these 60s clothes and I really liked that style as well. How old would you say you were when you felt like you'd really discovered your style DNA? I mean, I feel like I didn't discover my style for ages. I would just be wearing, you know, whatever I was pulled to. I remember really loving colour. And then when I was 12, I remember having this outfit from CNA that was, um, it was kind of almost like hair and pants, you know, brown with, and there was a jumper with a picture of a camel on. And But then I also remember when I was a teen, maybe 15, then I had my two sort of good jumpers, you know, my two good sweaters. And I would wear sort of a black crop top underneath these different off the shoulder jumpers. And it maybe it'd be like off to the left or off to the right or tilt it this way or back. I had all these different ways of wearing these two jumpers because I only had two. And I feel like that's when I kind of arrived at. Felt good in your skin. Yeah, I felt good in my skin. I was like, yes, you are kind of skinny, but if you wear things that fit, it will work, you know, and it will it'll be okay. And, and, you know, that's when that look became much more fashionable in the 90s, whereas when in the 80s when I was growing up, you know, everyone wanted to look like Samantha Fox or something, you know, kind of like cute and booby. Yeah. And that was never going to be me. But 90s was yeah. your era, Yeah, girl. so then I was like, oh, okay, this works for me, you know. I can, I can find, I can make clothes, you know. I used, would get like a scarf. They would have these stores where you had maybe two long silk scarves tied in knots and they would be in the bargain. Loved the bargain bin. I love you know, a scarf. Yeah, me too. And you can do so much with it. But I remember I was in this band called Helen. So I thought, I've got two purple scarves here. I'm going to sew them up and make them into a dress. And I did. And, you know, so I really liked to make, I, I never made good clothes, you know, but I guess I made stuff that I'd wear on stage. Yeah. And it was silver sequins one day and purple the other day. And right. yeah. Um, 
out of interest, when you're writing, do you have a, a uniform for that, a, what I would call a uniform, something that you just reach for, whether it's a corduroy jumpsuit or whatever, that you know you can just throw on and you can get creative in? I guess when I'm in my studio, I feel like it's really like not pretty. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm really scruffy. So sometimes, because I do work in my house, sometimes I will go upstairs, you know, with my hair in a bun, wearing a long T-shirt and some knickers. If it's hot, or my pajamas, or I like to wear big, you know, big cashmere jumper over some silk pajamas. Or I really like to be comfortable. I like to not think about how it looks at all yeah. because I think thinking about how it looks pulls me from away from my internal, and that is so much part of my creativity. That, that is exactly my question. Is yeah. you know, do what clothes do you throw on so that you can focus a hundred percent of your creativity? Yes. And your imagination in Yeah, th into those that. things would be really, really cozy things. You know, I really like, you know, a Margaret Howell or Toast or, you know, I'm back in the day, American Apparel, I'd wear, you yeah. know, just stretchy shorts and T-shirts and, you know, those kind yeah. of things. Yeah. I, I've read that um, you talked about moving to L.A. to let the sunshine in. That's your quote. Um, but can you tell me about that and how being in L.A., affected your style choices yes LA is so strange for um there's so much external you know in in Los Angeles and I always used to call the dressing style there asset presentation so it's not about what you like to wear it's about how what you wear can accentuate the most um valuable things of you like if you've got good boobs you should wear stuff that really shows that or if you've got legs you should show that or um and I I couldn't get into that asset presentation kind of style of dressing. You know, I thought it's really hot here, by the way. So I would, I just wore lots of loose things when I was in Los Angeles. I found myself wearing loads of white, um, lots of kind of, you know, loose jumpsuits and things. As that designer, Rachel Comey, I would wear her um, and, you know, sh sort of short things. But there is a thing, a feeling in LA of one is always on display and you're really aware of that, you know, don't go to, you don't go to Soho house without thinking about the shoes and the bag and the jacket and the thing. And because so many people will see you and you won't have time to talk to them, but they'll see you. So all they'll see is, you know, what you're wearing and they'll how you present your yourself. Clothes, yeah. Exactly. They'll read your clothes. So I would be able to do that when I was in all the public facing things I would have to really think about. And that's why it's so much fun to be at, you know, someone's barbecue, you know, and just be in a swim, a swimsuit and a big long shirt or something like that. You know, it was really nice to, to compare those two worlds, like the outward and the inward. But yeah, that's LA's a funny place for that. Your new album, Black Rainbows, is very much inspired by black history and culture. I wondered if that has affected your choice of clothes and designers for the album imagery and indeed the tour. Yes, it definitely has. When I was putting together the clothes for the album photos, we did some photos and we also made this book. And it's been shot by Koto Belofo, who I absolutely adore. And, you know, he's done so much great work in fashion and then around archive and MS and um, but he always has this romantic poetry aspect to what he does in clothes. And he's from South Africa, but he, he lived in the UK. Now he lives in France. And um, I always feel like the Koto girls, they were women, but they had that girlish, mm. playful energy. Mm -hmm. And it might be they're doing a cartwheel or they're sitting and their skirt's blown up. And, you know, they'd always have ruddy cheeks and be really vivacious life loving um so I, I thought about him and i thought i really i've always wanted to work with him and i managed to on this and but then yes yeah, specifically in for that book i thought i want to wear duro oluwu who i absolutely love and i want to wear grace wales bonner and at that time grace was just moving into women's clothes but she had all her historic archive which was all men's clothes and i've always looked at that you know you see the suiting and the beading and the cowrie shell headdresses mm. and so when i was putting it together i spoke to caroline isa who i love who's a great fashion director and she's, she's at tank and yeah. just super elegant and amazing woman and I said to her, I really want to wear Duro for this. And there's this cape that I've loved for 10 years. And there's this suit. And 
And then I said to her, and I really want to wear some of Grace's things, but I know they'd just be an archive now. And she was kind of like, leave it with me. <laughs> and then when I got to Chicago, I was got to open these boxes and, you know, these gorgeous things by Duro with little palm trees on and a little cape, you know, that made me think of my Caribbean grandmother or or um, the, the Grace Wells Bonner pieces, which are so heavily embellished and the kind of, you know, they're romantic, but they feel kind of militaristic and the, um, there's just so much working them. And then, yeah, getting to where at one point I had everything on, you know, the suit and the cowrie shell and um, Kota just says, it all just feels too much. It's really, it's kind of, it's overwhelming in the story that you're trying to tell. So he said, just go and put that shirt on and don't button it up. And I mean, he never showed my legs, but I was just wearing this shirt and my pants, you know, and holding it onto this little black doll. And that became the front cover of the of the book that we made. And also, you know, the cowrie shell, her dress was the same. It was don't wear, you know, be not in clothes, but be in this kind of crown. Mm. And, you know, and he did a really good shot from the side and... Uh, it's it's yeah. often more powerful just to focus on one thing. It is. Pilot it is, on. but of course, because I am, you know, I love fashion and because I guess I was held away from all these things for so long, I always think just more, 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 Magpie. more. So you just kind of <laughs> pile it on and then you can't even see yourself in it. So it, yeah, exactly that. You Just to have one thing always makes so much more of a statement. And, and I have thought about, yeah, so I wanted to use, work with Duro, who he was a really great artist as well. And, you know, and his heritage is Nigerian. I think his mum was Jamaican as well. So he has this Caribbean sort of British understanding and then this African sort of upper echelons royalty angle as well. Mm. You know, so he's re really fascinating to be mm. around. I mean, I've often talked about clothes being our armour. And I know that in 2008 you suffered a terrible loss. Your first husband, Jason Ray, died. Do you think you ever used clothes to give you strength or indeed protection during your grieving process? I definitely did. And I felt like in that in that loss, it was almost as though all my outward facing stuff was finished. You know, I, in terms of thinking about my, my music, I just thought, well, that, it, it felt like the end of my life. You know, he was 31. I was I was 29. But it felt like, oh, this is the end of my life. And um, I sort of thought, well, that's OK, because I've had this really great life, you know, that I had got to do all these things. And so, yeah, I definitely felt going for it. And it was just after we'd finished, I'd finished promoting our first record, I guess it will have been if it was 2008. So I, it would all been, you know, outward facing, Oprah, private jet, Grammys, you know, I was, everyone's watching great stylists who bring you stuff and you wear it and it goes and Mrs. Prada sent you some shoes and it was so then I, all of that stuff was just kind of sat in a room that I didn't go in mm. and then all I had was um I mean I had his clothes which I like to wear you know yeah. so I would have whatever would fit me of his you know I used to wear his clothes when I would maybe stay over at his house and then I'd have to go to work the next day and he was kind of you know skin in the waist so sometimes he he collected all this vintage Adidas from um he was from Aberdeen mm -hmm. and there was an army and navy store which somehow in the 90s realized they had this massive stash of original 70s jeans oh, and Adidas amazing. that they just kind of got out and of course all the teenagers and students lapped it up and Jason got all these amazing pieces so very often I'd be going to work in a, you know, an Adidas top and maybe some jeans with a belt really tied around and people would say, oh, I know where you were last night. You know, it's <laughs> like, oh, they'd, they'd know that I hadn't been home, you know, and I've just started getting together with him. So I had really nice memories of those clothes of yeah. being like, okay, when I got here, I was in a silver mini dress and now I've got to go to waitress. What can I wear from your wardrobe? <laughs> so it was really nice to be able to wear those things that made me feel closer to him, you know, yeah. his coats or... And then gradually it felt... Okay, I don't want to wear those things. And then and then I just went to the most comfortable things because I think it, when you're in real sort of grief or shock or trauma, even things like your um, dexterity is not the same. So things like faffing with buttons, yeah. zips, mm. lacing things, I just I could sort of, it seemed all too much to yeah. do anything like that. So everything was soft. Everything was, yeah, the old cashmere jumpers or cotton, you know, nothing was non-natural. 
you know, and sometimes I would have have stuff and I'd, you know, maybe fall asleep in that thing or, you know, so it wasn't, it was um, a new version of day to night dressing, right? Where you just like the, the time is elastic and you're not really going, I wasn't really going out of the house a lot. I might go for walks. I definitely wasn't going out, out. I didn't want to be around anyone. I felt like any everyone would want to talk to me about it and I didn't want to. And I was also dressing as a kind of camouflage because in a way that was my most, it was when I was most recognized, Yeah, you know? So I also really didn't want to be recognized because I knew people would, just like you naturally do with your newsfeed, they'll say, oh, it's her. Oh, there was that bad thing that happened. And so you'd some, I'd sometimes see people react with that smiley face, oh, the sad face, and they wouldn't know what to say. And of course, didn't want to talk to them about, a total stranger about that. So yeah, I definitely think my dressing took on a kind of, if if you are seeing me, I don't want you to think that I am the same person that you last saw in Mew Mew on Channel 4. You know, I want to be just away. So yeah, soft things, cotton things, cashmere things, layers, nothing with buttons, nothing with zips, nothing with loud, nothing loud, nothing fashiony at all. Proper little cocoon. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That a cocoon is a kind of uh, protection, but also a sort of saying to the world, you know, I don't want to engage, yeah. like read that from how I am, you know, dressed right now. Beautiful. Beautiful. You then went on to remarry. That's right, yeah. What was your second wedding dress like? Yeah, Tell me. Yeah, it's so funny because I remember my nana saying to me, oh, you're just going to have a small wedding now. And I said, no, I'm going to have, there's going to be 300 people. And because it's not like perhaps if you get divorced where you, you know, yeah. you guys have decided together this marriage hasn't worked or has failed. You know, I always say to people, the best marriages end with one person dying. That's how you agreed to yeah. do it, you know? Yeah. So you don't have to, if someone's partner, if someone's husband or wife has died, you don't have to kind of not mention it as though it's the same as or oh, awful divorce that they don't want to talk about, you yeah. know? But I think because of the age I was, nobody had any experience of, you know, an experience with a 20-year-old widow, you know? It's someone, a widow in their 20s. So a lot of people didn't really know how to talk to me about it, but that's why I'd always say, you know, you're really lucky if you're, if you get to be a widow or a widower. It's just that you want to be it when you're eighty, yeah. not when you're, you know, nearly yeah. thirty. So, um, so yeah, my I wanted uh, me and Steve's wedding to be a really big do because there was no, you know, he hadn't been married before. I had been married, and then I was a widow, and that was, yeah. you know, that's all good. Yeah. You know, that's all. It wasn't a failed marriage. It was like, it did its thing, and then. It was life. Yeah, exactly. One person died. And so, so yeah, I had had this, um, I think his surname was Stuart. I want to call it, but James Stewart. And I have to check that. But I met him because I think he used to do lots of clothes for people who were on, um, you know, some of the more well-known people in Leeds who would be on maybe a Coronation Street mm. or, or in Manchester, you know, there's that scene in the north of England. So he would be making event dressing for them. And he also did brides. And I saw his work and I had something in mind and I really wanted pure lace and yep. I really wanted something very kind of tight and high and kind of like pointy boobies and I, and I wanted it to be a small waist and then I wanted it to be just big silk. You know, when, when Jason and I had, had got married, it was kind of like a slip of a thing, you know, so I really wanted, you know, and I yeah. wanted a veil. My mum made me a veil and it's, oh, so it's all very dramatic. And then I wanted to wear flowers, you know, I wanted to, have like a, a flower crown like a Frida Kahlo and I remember saying to the florist give me tons of flowers I can put in my own hair and then give me bits I can put to the bridesmaids and there were loads of bridesmaids as well and I remember my uh, hairstylist at the time he's called Kenner Kenor and he has Kennerland which is in is in um, London and New York he's brilliant and I remember him doing my hair and I said, wow, it looks amazing. And I said, oh, are you right to put the rest of the flowers in the bridesmaid's hair? Said, what rest of the flowers? <laughs> he just put it all, just all on me. And I love that, that, you know, it looks amazing now. In 12 hours, it's going to be just wilted. You know, it's not sitting anything, but just the sort of freshness of it. So, you know, we got married in winter. It's a winter feast and, and this, you know, the light was going down and it was really beautiful. But yeah, I wanted to be, here I am in this, you know, going into this just full of joy and and also with the same kind of poignancy that I never thought 
I never thought I would get to be married. I never thought I would get to have children because when I was 29, because I thought my life was over, I thought, well, I'll never get to have kids. I won't be, I'll never be able to meet someone in time to sort of, oh. you know, have children. Like I kind of written it all off. And, you know, I had my kids kind of later, like late thirties and early forties. So again, that's just a, a, a blessing that I didn't think that would have. So what a joyous yeah. image though yeah. of you in this good pure lace dress with all these fresh flowers. How beautifully. Fundamentally, who would you say you dress for? Yourself, I your husband, yeah, your I definitely audience. think I dress for myself. I definitely do. Sometimes I come downstairs and I can see um, you know, Steve's kind of like his head on the side is like, um uh, uh. and sometimes if I'm not sure about it, I might say, yeah, this is weird. But if I really love it, I'll just say, you don't get it. You know, and sometimes it makes me re even more kind of steely in my idea of like, yeah, this is a very weird fake fur bolero that I got from Mark Jacobs that ends here. It makes me look a bit like a Russian bear in a performing circus. <laughs> but that is what I'm wearing tonight. Let's go. You know, so I, I definitely dress myself. I like wearing strange things. I like things that... that um challenge i like to stand out in a certain way um you know when i'm out and about and yeah i mean i just think clothes are clothes are fantastic you know i definitely have spent too much of what has come to me on clothes but at the same time i i had always wanted to do that when i was yeah. a kid and never be you know always seen them in the window and thought oh if only or tried them on and handed them back over so now you know it's great to be able to say i'll have that yeah how would you describe your style DNA in three words? Um, that's um, how would I describe it? I mean, I like playful. You know, I don't like the clothes to be too serious. I'm not trying to do the asset presentation, so I'd say pl playful is definitely one. I like classic. Like, I don't like anything too that it feels like it's a cr of the crazily of the moment, like a mini skirt with the pockets hanging down or, you know, made of plastic or whatever. I would probably wouldn't wear that. And I would, so I'd say it's playful. I'd say it's classic. And I also think I try to wear things that suit me. Like I wouldn't just see something on the runway and think I have to have that. You know, I, I feel like I can just let things go past that aren't for me. So I think it has to be kind of playful and classic and fitting. Yeah. Love that. Would you consider you have a style icon? I think when I first started in music, I loved Audrey Hepburn and everything that was Audrey Hepburn and the tiny waist and the ballet flats and the shape, especially because I had been, you know, skinny. I thought, oh, here's this skinny but super elegant woman. And I liked her strange accent and I liked, you know, her big eyes. And I related to that. And I think um, I remember sitting down with someone and saying, my style icon, yes, Hepburn. And he said, Catherine or Audrey. And I, th I was looking at him like, well, what do you think? Of course I mean Audrey Hepburn. But all these years later, I feel the pull of Catherine Hepburn and the collars upturned and the man, the men's trousers and the kind of angles in the face and there's intellectualism and the kind of jutted chin and the, um, you know, so... I think I love I love Catherine Hepburn's style, the kind of no nonsense mm. style of it. And I think in my everyday, you know, when I'm not on stage or when I'm not at an event, I am in kind of you know the high waisted trousers and something kind of big and something with a bit that's on my shoulders or an old a sort of man's Welsh knitted top. You know, there's this brilliant suiting place that I found opposite Charlotte Mensa when I was getting my hair cut. I think everybody knows of it as a classic place. I have to look it up. But I just wandered over and had, you know, one suit in the window and he measured me for something. And he said, you know, it's going to take about nine months to make. And I said, oh, OK. But that's where it, that's to me the height of style now. It's like you want it. Yeah, you can't have it for a year. Isn't that lovely? And you have to send though? me some pictures. In this world of such disposable, available Yes. Everything. Yes. The shop's called Speciale. Speciale. Do you know, he, he's an Italian, ta he learned from this Italian tailor oh, in Venice. Lovely. Lovely. The guy passed away and he's the one who's carrying the tradition. And yeah, yeah. But the, thought, there is something gorgeous, isn't there, about that um, tailoring tradition of oh, love? Yeah, it. yeah. The history of that. Would you say your style has changed through the decades? I think my style has changed and I guess my body's changed as well, you know, with having my children, not dramatically, but in ways that I see and feel. And so I do feel 
um i appreciate a kind of mannish look now i feel like that you know conversely sort of brings up my femininity yeah. more whereas if i try and do something kind of girlish that doesn't that it doesn't read the same way as when i was kind of eight stone and mm. and 26 years old you know mm. do you have one piece of clothing that means the most to you mm, that's a really good question that's a really good question i mean it's funny because i've got these boots that i always perform in and i thought i'd lost them and i was so sad and i didn't realize how attached i was to them but they they gucci from when it was alessandro michelle and um they're they're gold metallic and they've got fringes i've worn them so many times hundreds of times but I've never worn them outside because I'm always wearing them on stage and I feel like I'm really attached to those mm. boots you know they've got a decent heel but I feel very secure on them when I'm playing my guitar and I can stomp on my pedals and I can kind of run around or dance around or jump off stage and jump back on so they to me they're sort of I guess that collection to me was like um bow it's 1970s bowie or something mm. and I thought that's my that's my version of it. So I really do like those boots. Brilliant. I mean, you lead an incredibly busy life. You're a mother, you're a wife, you're writing, you're performing, you're touring, um, not to mention the sort of inevitable promotional junket that you must be on and off and on and off. Um, is your wardrobe phenomenally organised? I feel like my wardrobe is really organised into me... Being like, here I am, I'm doing my music, I'm in the world, everyone is around, everyone's seeing me. And then, then, and that's in a room, you know, and I love to see it and look around and there's nothing I can get rid of. You know, Steve's like, do you need all this stuff? Of course I need it. <laughs> of course I'll never wear this again, but I've got it because I remember in 2006 when I wore this all the time. And so it's there, you know, and the moths are your enemy, of course, and you have the, you know, all the wood and everything to try and make it work. But then I've got my everyday wardrobe, which is kind of well-worn T-shirts. It's comfortable things. It's a load of jumpsuits. It's a good amount of corduroy and some, as I was saying, Margaret Howell and, um, you know, some good shirts and some some good T-shirts, and some good jumpers from that speciality, the, you know, the, the Welsh wool people. And um, a bit of Vivian Westwood because not just because it's the only really sort of high-end place in Leeds, but it is also the only sort of freestanding boutique in Leeds. And I go in there often and I've got a disproportionate amount of Vivian Westwood because I like to go into a place and it's quiet and there's only one thing on the rack and all of that. So yeah, I've got some good Vivian Westwood stuff. And, and I like Vivian Westwood so good because it also might read as a charity shop jumper, you know, sometimes. So when I'm dropping my kids off at school, people say, oh, I love that jumper. And I won't say, yes, it's Vivian Westwood. I'll say, oh, thank you, because it looks like it's, you know, knitted in Peru and I might have just picked it up at the Oxfam shop. She was brilliant at that, wasn't she? Yeah. Um, but it was so beautifully designed yeah, yeah. and cut yeah, or knitted. But but really, you know, the the detail. Was... Yeah, the de Yeah, exactly. The amount of work in the piece was always really good and is good. Do you archive all your, what I would call your important looks? So looks that you may have collected awards in or particular looks from a tour or photos from an album cover, that sort of thing. Do you keep those very carefully archived? I guess if I think about it, yeah. I mean, I don't sort of take a photo of them or write them down, but in a way I don't need to because they're really in my yeah. head. So, you know, I've got these pink ballet shoes with um, the straps going up and they're really worn out now. But I remember I wore these in a field in South Africa when I was making the video for Put Your Records On and, the, you know, the it looked very beautiful, but the cornfield had just been chopped and those corn stucks were slicing my legs and I had scars on my legs for, for you know, 10 years from them. But I remember these shoes and um, there was a little white Marc Jacobs blouse and I can't remember the sh I might have had some pedal pushes on or something. I remember the image, yeah. But I really, you know, I've got that blouse, I've got those shoes because they're really special to me and they're, they're what I wore. And then that was the thing that people, the first thing really that people saw of me, mm. you know, and the ballet flats became, yeah. you know, an important thing. And I, and I did want to wear 
something that wasn't, I was trying, I'm not trying to be super womanly and grown up, you know, I was trying to bring my girl self into my adulthood in, mm. in all those clothes. And so yeah, that they were a big sort of leader in that. What, if anything, do you feel you've got an excessive amount of in your wardrobe? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I do have a lot of shoes. I love shoes. I love the kind of um, the sculptural nature of shoes. And and that the reason I say that is because a lot of the times the shoes aren't very comfortable, you know. So <laughs> there's these Mimi shoes, which I absolutely adored, but the, the just the rise and what it did to the arch of my foot, you know, I just... Oh, I remember the feeling of sort of limping along the street after being in those, you know, for a good 12 hours, you know, but I remember thinking, okay, you can't, you can't wear these anymore. But I, of course, I've still, you know, still got them there. Or sometimes I'll buy things that look amazing. Like it's a massive cork heel and then there's leather and there's just a little thong that keeps you on there. But I know they're not practical, you know, but I'll wear them. I'll wear them for awards or I'll wear them at a party or I'll wear them, even just wearing them for photos. But then... I like to keep things. So honestly, how many pairs of shoes do you own? I don't know. It definitely won't be anything near all these fashion people. It won't be anything near those, you know, people. But a good amount for a sort of post-Christian working class girl, it feels like a guilty amount of shoes. <laughs> That's a really good answer. <laughs> so what's your approach to sustainable fashion then? I guess my, my approach is this. I like to buy I'll always wear natural fabrics that's partly because I sort of became a bit allergic to deodorant at one point you know and the aluminium then I changed to a non-aluminium deodorant and then you know I'm always laughing at you know with people that I'm sweating on stage you know and I think well I had a shower this morning and this thing is going to go in the wash and that's all, all you can do really is um so I always have to wear breathable clean breathable fabrics and I think even just starting there is a really good point. You know, you wearing something cotton that's going to be able to be passed down. It's going to be able to be washed. It's it's going to rot down. I mean, thinking about plastic and the fact that all that plastic is going to outlive us, mm. it doesn't feel good. So I'm not someone who's got loads of polyester. I mean, I can't wear that stuff just for my own, but for my body. And I feel like it's not healthy for you. So I guess my sustainable stuff is looked at from, from that point of view, that what's healthy for your body is also healthy for the planet but um yeah that's probably as far as I've really looked into it but I think that makes a small difference so what do you do with your clothes when you've actually when you've had enough of them when I've had enough of them I give them charity so um yeah I just fold them up give them give but them you to don't charity. give them to charity as Corin Bailey Rays. No, I just give them to local shops because I always think it must be fun, you know, a local shop when they're sorting through, right? Oh, there's the H&M and the Zara. And then you think, oh, there's this. And it's, a you know, a fancy label and they could sell it for more. Mm. Or, you know, so I think people are doing that. I mean, I think sometimes at charity shops, something doesn't even end up in the shop. Sometimes they'll sell it online. And I always think whatever they can do to get the money from from the garment, that's really worth it. it it's such a good feeling, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, yeah, it really is. I mean, I have a lot of shrunk wool. Wool seems to end up getting spun or, or heated in my house. So then you can make things out of that. Kid, the kids get it or you can make it shrink into the down to a child or, yeah all of that really stiffened wool but you know you can use it for you can you can't unravel it because it's basically felt but you know you can you can sew with it you know i like to kind of make stir for you know all of that what would you say is the oldest piece in your wardrobe and the oldest piece i know because everything else has gone um it's i mean i guess i've got old things that my mum would have given me or vintage things oh lovely so um yeah she was always like she would wear bieber or she'd wear you know silk two pieces from labels i don't know amazing so she had a lot of stuff like that from the 70s so i've got some things like that or um i'm trying to think but the stuff from my own collection you know it would just be like a little sweater from top shop that i bought when i was 15 that still somehow is kind of stylish even though everything else has been chucked out and replaced with much more lovely things. And, you know, I wouldn't, I, I can't, I don't wear it, but I can't bring myself to throw it away. Mm. And I did wear that in a photo, you know, when I first started out and I think for the observer. So just think, oh, I'll keep that when, you know, that was, I bought that one from my waitressing money and I'll keep that. There's so much nostalgia attached to clothes though, isn't there? Yeah, there really, there really is. You remember what you were doing. Remember when you bought it, remember yeah. all the times you've had in it. Yeah. I'm going to spin around to some quick fire questions now. 
What fashion advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? 20-year-old self, I'd just say enjoy it. You know, that's when I was just working at, in a club and I was buying all sorts of little things and, you know, going out, trying to cut up bras. At that time, you know, it was like you really didn't want people to see your nipples and those even the impression of your nipples was kind of so risque or not chic. So I remember I'd say just stop cutting up those bras. <laughs> it's fine. Just get get out there. Get out there, you yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> Which fashion trend would you like to see make a comeback? I mean, I really liked that that era at Prada when they'd obviously seen that photograph of, it was like David Bowie, maybe Rick, Mick Ronson on a train and they're wearing these wide shoulders and there's these beautiful patterns and this, the fabric's really elegant. And I only selfishly would like to see that again because there's so many bits I would love to add to like I had the jacket but not the trousers now I'd get the trousers and yeah those suits I'd love to buy a whole load of suits like that and fashion or beauty trend that you would consign to room 101 oh definitely the sort of slug eyebrows you know that those kind of <laughs> <laughs> I think there's so many kids you know like beautiful 17 year old girls who don't need a scrap of makeup just totally caked in makeup which looks fine in a photo and in real life it's like <gasps> It's more than you'd wear in kind of, a, you know, West End musical or something, you know, that I just feel like, oh, you're 17, you know, just don't, don't waste your time, you know, you're gorgeous. Your last impulse buy? Hmm. Gosh, I feel like I haven't bought, I almost bought this beautiful chandelier type, you know, um, halter neck thing at Mimi with the top and the skirt and it was, you know, it was gorgeous, but I thought... You know, my accountant is really not going to appreciate it. it. Was, you know, you know when somebody's had so much work, you think I understand why this is a seven thousand pound outfit, but I probably don't need to be getting that right now. So, I just kind of waved goodbye to it. So yeah, I rode out my impulse in that situation. Your views on tattoos? I love tattoos on other people. I would never get one because I can never make up my mind. Something I love today is something that I like. Embarrassed that I used to like, you know, in terms of imagery or you know and I'm just not chilled enough to be like oh that was the old me so I like them on other people and on myself I probably will never have one beauty treatment you couldn't give up um I love those eye under eye patch things because I always feel like I really need them so I was wearing them one in the taxi today you know there's I wish it was acceptable to wear them all the time I just have them on instead of my actual face you know high end or high street I like high end. I like to have less. I feel like I have less clothes than a lot of people, but I'd, I like it to keep it fancy and then just wear, I don't know, the the t-shirt underneath or whatever. Bling or bear? Bear. Minimalism or maximalism? Maximalism. Couture or charity shop? Couture. Crocs, cute or puke? I like Crocs on the kids. I probably won't wear them myself. Sneakers or stilettos? I don't really have any sneakers, so yeah, go stilettos. Skinnies, boyfriends or wide legs? Wide legs for me now. Bodycon or boho? Boho. Sports lux or rock chick? Rock chick. Trend or style? Style. Experimental or uniform? Experimental. Cashmere or cotton? Cashmere. Even though the moths, oh, those moths. Shapewear or sexy lingerie? Sexy lingerie. Tights or stockings? I like tights. Bikini or one piece? I like a bikini. Beanie or beret? Beret. And finally, at the end of the day, what do you or don't you wear in bed? Nothing. Corinne, it has been such a joy, a Thank fascinating you. journey with you. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Thank you for sharing your style journey with me. It's been really, really lovely. Thanks for your time. It's oh, really fun. thank you for yours. And if I could turn the tables on you and ask, what would be the one style question you would ask me? I would ask you, what do you think drives a person to design? What drives you to design? Oh, that is an innate desire to make women feel the best version of themselves. I just know the power of if you feel great in your clothes, you're just going to go out there and do the best job, be the best mother, be the best wife or friend or just have the best day. That's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.